everyone, welcome back to Nintendo Prime. We got a bunch of stories. This is actually one of our biggest news videos we've done in quite some time. I kid you not when I say there is a bunch of huge stories in here, pretty much all pertaining to Nintendo Switch. We do have um, a few stories for the Xbox behind us that we're gonna get to in our very first thing that we do. But before we get into all of that, I wanna remind you that, hey, guess what? We're giving away some Metroid Dread copies. To enter, all you need to do is head under the description or the pinned comment and click on the viral sweep link and then complete the stuff there and we will choose winners at the end of the month. Also, by the way, later this year, we're actually doing a massive giveaway uh, that's gonna be happening around the holiday season as I try to give back to as many of you as possible. You guys might remember the huge giveaways we did back during E3. Let's just say we might be trying to bring it back around again for the holiday season. That's right, folks. We want to try to make everyone's holiday just a little bit sweeter. Uh, for all those giveaways, we're not gonna get into too many details on it yet because everything is still being planned out, but we do know that you will need to be subscribed to enter. So, hey, if you're not subscribed yet, you know what? I'm gonna come over to your house and kick your dog. And if you don't have a dog, maybe I'll punt your pet rat out the window. I, I, let's get into the news. All right, this first stuff comes um, it comes basically directly from Microsoft. Um, and the first part is that Microsoft's Game Pass actually missed on its planned year-over-year -year growth margins. So at this point, a year ago, they had planned for Game Pass to grow by roughly 48% over what it was the year before. The thing is, it only grew by 37%, missing by 11%. Now, the key thing to remember was at this point last year, there was still some faint hope that Halo Infinite was going to be coming out this holiday. In fact, Microsoft was pretty adamant about it at the time. So technically, you can argue some of this growth is because Halo Infinite didn't come out. In fact, I think the largest exclusive game to come to Xbox, at least exclusive at the time, was like the medium. Uh, so they're obviously waiting for the big influx of all these studios they bought to have all these games come out to really push Game Pass. So I'm not so sure that Microsoft is shocked or surprised by that 37% growth. It's still growth, by the way, which is really, really good. So we'll have to wait and see uh, what happens in the next year when it looks like all three of the current platforms for counting PC are going to have huge years with a ton of new games. So we'll have to wait and see what happens then. Um, what's also interesting here is there was 18 million, by the way. If you want to put a number on how many Game Pass subscribers there were, the last official numbers from Microsoft were 18 million back in January, but that's included in this last year. So it's hard to really know where Game Pass subscribers are today. I'd say it's safe to say it's north of 20 million, but um, beyond that, I'm not really sure what numbers you could put on it. Um, as a side note though, um, the Xbox Series uh, systems, the X and S, have had the best launch of an Xbox platform in Japan history in terms of sales to date. So that's really good for Microsoft. They did say a while ago, Phil Spencer did, that they were making some headway into Japan, and well, yeah, this isn't like major numbers that's gonna compete with Nintendo or even PlayStation. Still, it's nice to see Microsoft at least growing in a potential emerging market for them. Um, so there is that. Uh, beyond all of that, um, it looks like Phil Spencer has informed the world that they're not done buying video game studios. If you remember, there's a little bit of a controversy. I wouldn't even call it controversial, but I would say PlayStation fans were pretty upset. Uh, when Microsoft went ahead and bought out uh, ZeniMax, or what is it, ZeniMax? I don't know. The parent company of Bethesda, basically, and got, you know, id software and everything else underneath all of that, including the next Elder Scrolls game. Uh, we know about the next major game from Bethesda is going to be exclusive. So there's exclusive to Xbox Game Pass platforms, by the way. If PlayStation would allow Game Pass to be there, the games would be there. But um, he had this to say when asked about future acquisitions. Uh, in a recent interview, he said, so we're always out there looking for people who we think would be a good match and teams that would be a good match with our strategy. So we're definitely not done. There's no quota. There's no kind of timeline where I have to go acquire studios by a certain time. But if we find a studio where we have a good fit, we share what we're trying to go do and what they're trying to go do. And if we feel we can both get to better together, absolutely. It's one of the privileges 
we have being at Microsoft and having the capability to take a long-term approach and adding amazing creators to the portfolios is an important part of that. And that is a unique uh, capability Microsoft does have when it comes to video games is because they're, they're a small, really tiny branch, to be completely honest, compared to the whole of Microsoft. And Microsoft itself is such a profitable business that they can take a long-term approach and be like, hey, look, we don't need to be profitable now. We don't need to care if gamers are happy with the Xbox Series X now. We need to worry about down the road. And they are able to basically create their own little video game empire here by buying up a bunch of studios because they've obviously struggled to found their own studios. They do have some, some internal studios, hence that's where Age of Empires and stuff all came from. But reality is they have obviously had a hard time um, you know, building up studios like a lot of companies do. So they're buying up known studios and building an empire that might be like a Netflix of gaming style empire someday. So we'll have to wait and see because they're definitely the one company being like, hey, look, what Netflix and Hulu and Amazon Prime and all these digital content um, delivery platforms for movies and TV have done, why can't we do something like that? We already have streaming in tow. We already have Game Pass. Why can't we be that but for gaming? Because nobody else is really doing it like they are. Now, there's other streaming competitors, but again, nobody's doing it like they are. Because very few companies can afford to do it like they are. I do think Amazon is attempting to, by the way, with their streaming service, but um, they don't have the, the, the same breadth of content available on that service that's not even public yet. Next up, I wanna briefly talk about this picture behind me. This is the N64 controller as unveiled by Nintendo in a Nintendo Direct for the Nintendo Switch. This is to coincide with N64 and Genesis games coming to Switch. And yes, there's a Genesis controller as well, but we're focusing on this one because obviously it's sold out I think in 15 minutes or less, it might've even been like three minutes or less uh, once it became available. Now Nintendo has promised more restocks of pre-orders to come later in October. I don't know, maybe on launch day beats me. It's still gonna take a couple weeks after you order to even get one. Uh, and it's it, it, it retails for $50. It's a wireless N64 controller that we presume has a fixed control stick. That like if it didn't fix the control stick and it's still using the original N64 control stick, absolutely this would not be worth $50. But people would still maybe want to get it for nostalgia reasons alone. Plus it works natively with Switch without any modifications. Here's the thing, it's sold out. No surprise there, right? Um, I mean, maybe when you consider the backlash over Nintendo Switch Online expansion pack pricing, but honestly, people will buy this even just to use with their PCs. And as long as they fix the control stick, it's not that terrible of a nostalgic controller just to have on and heck, people might even use it with emulators. But here's the thing, it's sold out. So it's probably gonna sell out the next restock and maybe the one after that. And the question is, well then how can you get one? Well, places like eBay, where it is being scalped for at minimum $120, some being scalped as high as $250. And that, some of those listings, by the way, that are 250 do include the Genesis controller, but a lot of them don't telling you that, um, yeah, this is a highly scalped item and it's always unfortunate when scalpers get their grubby hands on things. Now, by the way, I am not someone that believes that scalping should go away or be a crime, uh, not in the United States anyway. It is your right to buy and resell things that you quote unquote own. So I am not going to say that right should go away. I do think there are things retailers could be doing to help curb the amount of these that can be bought by scalpers. Um, there is always bots and all these things working around these websites that are making it very um, likely that one person is ordering, you know, 20 of these things uh, and that sucks. But, but I do feel there are better measures that should be put in place at a lot of these retailers. So I don't know, maybe this is just uh, wishful thinking, but um, it, it, it sucks that <sighs> scalpers seem to be running the electronics industry right now. I will note, by the way, though, never pay scalper prices for Switch OLED. There have been regular in-person restocks at retail outlets since it came out. I'm not saying they don't sell out fast, especially depending on where you live, but please, if you're trying to get a Switch OLED, don't pay scalper prices. Now, when it comes to this thing, I have no idea when you'll be 
easily able to buy it. It's possible it's also a limited run, which Nintendo does these limited run things sometimes, which then just really makes the scalping community excited. So, <sighs> sorry that it's so difficult for legit consumers to get their hands on these. Uh, last I saw there was over like 8,000 listings on eBay. I, it, I don't know, that's like 6,000 too many to me, but whatever, let's move on to our next story. So there's a new column from Sakurai coming out in the Famitsu Magazine. And in this, he talks about how the second fighter pass for uh, Super Smash Bros. Ultimate was actually only supposed to have five characters. It means it was supposed to end with that Tekken character. Now maybe with, when there originally was only gonna be five, maybe they would have reordered the characters and had a different one be the ender, but it wasn't supposed to have six characters. Now, if you remember, every character in these DLC fighter packs were actually chosen by Nintendo. At least that's what Sakurai told us before. Sora was a bit of a different story because Sora was never actually being seriously considered to be added to Smash Bros. There was too many hoops to jump through to make that happen. Now, obviously Sakurai did know it was the number one most voted thing in the old Wii U slash 3DS Smash character polls, so he knew there was a lot of fan demand for the character, but he never realistically was going to put it in the game. And obviously, um, with only five characters and those five picked by Nintendo, that was it. So how the hell did we get Sora in Smash? Well, Sora attended an awards show, uh, and there he actually bumped into a Disney executive. And the ball got rolling from that point where naturally, him being a massive Kingdom Hearts fan and always wanting to put Sora into Smash, broached the topic with this executive, and the executive said, you know what, let's try to make this happen. Obviously, things went from there um, to you know go going up the chain and getting more approvals from Disney, obviously going back to Square, where there probably was little resistance from Square, and bada bing, bada boom, we got Sora in Smash. So, Sora was not actually planned to be part of this DLC pack. It also explains why maybe there's a few less like me costumes and other things because they kind of had to throw together some stuff um, to try to justify like the additional content along with Sora. Uh, so yeah, although getting Doom Guy in was pretty cool. Um, it, it's still one of those situations where it's fascinating just to hear some behind the scenes stuff because we all knew like Sora, getting Sora in Smash is almost, almost as difficult as getting something like GoldenEye to appear on Nintendo Switch Online. There's so many people with various copyrights over that original N64 game that it just feels impossible that an agreement can ever be reached to bring that to Switch, despite how popular that would be for Nintendo Switch Online with the online multiplayer. So again, um, Sora happened. So at this point, I almost feel like anything is possible. Hell, at this point, Maybe Cyberpunk comes to Switch, even though I'm not sure anyone would even be excited about that. They can't seem to finish the game, even though it's already been out, let alone get the next-gen versions done, and now they're hiring 80 people to try to do DLC for a game that's, in my opinion, unfinished. It is what it is. CD Projekt Red, big oopsie with that one. So this story is a small one. Well, it's not small in importance, but it's not getting attention. Nobody seems to be talking about this, and I verified it myself. Um, I am about to call out Activision Blizzard. I know, they're actually probably excited about this, right? So Diablo 2, this, this, this resurrected game, came to Nintendo Switch. Great, right? We got in Diablo games before, it's cool. You know what's not being talked about right now? The fact that for the last four days, Diablo 2 servers, have been offline for Nintendo Switch. Completely offline. Now, server maintenance is a thing, bugs can be a thing, but Activision Blizzard has said nothing. People have contacted them through phone calls, they've contacted them on social media, they've sent emails, and nobody is able to get a response. It's either, there's a couple of things that might happen here. Either there really is some serious stuff going on and they're trying to keep it under wraps, um, so they shut down the servers, things like, account information leaking or all that jazz. Or, or, this is the bad thing. The servers could be shut down and they're just not telling anybody. So, I'm gonna call you out Activision Blizzard for one thing and one thing only. Communication. Communicate with, it might be a small fan base playing this on Switch, 
but communicate to them. If you have completely abandoned this game on Switch and shut down the servers, they deserve to know. So does anybody else still willing to purchase the game since it's still readily available on the Nintendo Switch eShop. In fact, if you're shutting down the servers, you should be yanking the game off the eShop, in my opinion, or Nintendo should boot it off. If there is just bugs happening or employee strikes that are causing issues, again, communication. Notably, servers for this game on other platforms are up and running just fine. So it does seem to be a Switch specific issue, which makes me kind of feel like maybe they've just shut down the servers and they're dumb but I hope that's not the case. The game hasn't been out that long. Um, and Activision Blizzard, that would be some pretty shady crap. Stop treating Switch people like second-class citizens. You release the game on our platform. If the servers are gonna be down for days and days at a time, tell us, we deserve to know. So Life is Strange is obviously a very polarizing series. Uh, very story-driven, it's an indie game. Uh, the original Life is Strange obviously uh, performed very, very well, really outperformed expectations at the time. And now we have the new one, Life is Strange True Colors here. Now, they announced it was coming to Switch and we haven't really gotten any updates on when it would be available digitally uh, until today. The official Life is Strange uh, Twitter account put out an update and it's a welcome one because again, as we just noted with Blizzard, no communication, here's direct communication. This is how you address actual fans of your game. It says, an update for Nintendo Switch players. Excitedly, by the way, exclamation point. We're happy to announce that the digital edition of Life is Strange True Colors will release in early December. No exact day here, but still, early December is not too far from now. Keep your eyes peeled for the exact release date in the coming weeks. We'll announce it when we open the digital reorders. And again, they're probably waiting for final approvals from Nintendo, so then they can pick an exact date that's going to work, obviously basing it around other releases on Switch at that time, like releasing it the same day as, say, Advance Wars 1 Plus 2 Reboot Camp, maybe not a good idea, but releasing it, you know, a week later, maybe. So again, this is really good news for anyone really interested in this game. I'm sure it's gonna run and play fantastically on Switch. This feels like a game perfect for the OLED, by the way. The colors in this game are really gonna be so vivid and popping um it, it, it's gonna really invoke some emotions that you might not get on a non-oled screen which by the way you might have oled tvs and already get this anyways but still um i think this is really cool uh and by the way speaking of switch oled let's get on to our next story because there's some expected but confusing news for people who have never dealt with oled panels before in regards to the nintendo switch so the Switch OLED's out in the wild. We've obviously been having a lot of fun with it. There's been a lot of surprisingly um, good uh, remarks about it because people were obviously hypercritical of Switch OLED heading into launch. And now that it's here, people actually think the OLED screen is a bigger deal than, um, than, than initially thought. But here's one thing that happens with OLED panels specifically. And people are starting to notice this on places like the official Nintendo Switch Reddit. Now, of note, we're not talking about burn-in, of course, that's an issue people all know about OLED, but burn-in's very difficult to make happen on OLED panels these days, especially when the system hasn't been around long enough for it to become a problem. However, um, someone, I shouldn't say someone, a number of people have noticed green tinting of the screen. This is where it almost feels like there's a green um, filter being put over the entire screen. Uh, this is a known issue with OLED panels. And by the way, it doesn't have to be green. It could be red, it could be blue, because um, it's based on how the screen was calibrated and how they placed the colors over the LEDs. I know this feels really, really weird and it gets super technical. So I'm not gonna dive into all the details. I will link to an article down in the description for people that wanna dive deeper into how this tinting occurs in OLED panels and why it's so specific to OLED panels. Um, they're, if it's just localized, um, yeah, you are screwed. Um, if, like if the whole screen isn't a certain color, but like part of it is, you're screwed. Now this is normally noticed at brightness settings of five, 10 or 15%. If you go in between those settings or well above those settings, uh, you typically aren't going to notice this. This is something that's more noticed on lower, um, you know, brightness settings. But uh, yeah, it's still something that sucks especially for people that like to play in low light situations or they also don't want the screen blasting them and straining their eyes 
Uh, so what can you do? Well, first off, return your OLED and get a refund and get a new one. Uh, this is a problem that happens at manufacturing and it's not always caught because the level of testing they do on the screens there um, is usually done at higher brightness settings so they don't catch this. Uh, also, if it happens to be uh, the entire screen is green, the entire screen is, is, is a little pink hue or a little blue hue, there are calibration devices you can buy that can help recalibrate your screen. But again, this requires extra work on you. I would still say, bring it back and exchange it. And you might say, but what if I get another one and it does the same thing? Keep exchanging it because this is a manufacturing flaw with OLED panels. It's well known. People freak out about it. It happens on iPhones. It happens on TVs. Um, and it sucks when it does happen because it can be a bit of a hassle to go through a refund or exchange process, but don't just accept it and move on. Now, if you're someone who's always going to play in brighter, uh, you know, at the brighter settings anyways, I guess maybe you don't care and it's not going to leak into those brighter settings. But again, it is something that is factually occurring for some people. This is a known flaw with OLED panel manufacturing because it's very um, easy for this flaw to occur in the manufacturing process. It's not intentional, even though robots are doing this. It's still, it, it requires like 0 0.001 of a millimeter off. It can actually cause this. So um, yeah, just exchange guys, exchange. There, there, there's no other um, solution out there. You could try to call out Nintendo. It's not really their fault. This is just, hey, it's part and parcel with OLED panels. It's not a issue that should be widespread. It usually happens on a very small percentage of panels. So obviously be on Samsung, the manufacturer. Uh, but yeah, so again, it's just something that uh, it, to be aware of that don't just accept or think it's going to go away over time because it won't. And lastly today, I just want to say today is the fifth anniversary of something very special. The unveiling of not necessarily this OLED, but the Nintendo Switch. That's right, five years ago today, Nintendo dropped the trailer that unveiled Nintendo Switch to all of us and actually gave us our very first ever tease of what would be Mario Odyssey. They literally had not even announced this Mario game and they showed somebody playing it in this trailer. It really got us all buzzing about the platform, us, you know, showing Breath of the Wild. Literally, the guy's playing it on TV and we're like, okay, this is pretty cool. We get to see Nintendo's new system. And then he picks it up and walks out the door with his dog. It was just a mind blowing moment um, at that time because we hadn't had a device that was so simple to do, let alone a hybrid Nintendo device. So it was really, really cool. And obviously the tease of Mario helped. Uh, the playing of one, two switch on the rooftop and all the jokes about Karen. And yeah, it was all good, good fun five years ago. And it's amazing because who knew five years ago, this is where we would be today, where switch is essentially on the cusp of selling a hundred million units and becoming one of the best. It's already one of the best selling Nintendo platforms of all time, potentially in the past Game Boy, maybe catch up to DS. We'll have to wait and see. Nintendo's obviously on a roll. 2022 is looking packed as 2022. Hey, March 3rd, that is the official fifth anniversary of the release of the platform, which means once we're past that day, we're into year six, baby. Holy crap. And Switch is still going strong despite new systems coming from other companies, despite the Steam Deck coming out as well. The Switch is still doing as strong as ever, maybe even stronger, although last year technically was the biggest sales year. But we'll have to wait and see what happens with OLED and anything moving forward and all the we're not going to get into some of the stuff that rumors and all that. So let's just leave it at this. Thank you, Nintendo, for giving me a platform that made me kind of fall in love with gaming all over again. Not an insult to Wii U, not an insult to PlayStation and Xbox. I just, I, Switch came out at a point in my life when I just had, you know, I, I, had, a, I had a son who was just turning one years old uh, and I was having a really hard time finding time to game. And it's even hard now parent of three full-time college job youtube um trying to find time for my fiance can be hard we have a meetup by the way happening this saturday and i just it was hard to find time to game and we you offered me a little bit of ability to play off my tv but i was still tethered to like the one room uh switch really opened doors for me to continue to play console level gaming anywhere 
Uh, and I love that. So um, thank you, Nintendo, for that. There's other things that you need to fix and improve. Some you did fix with this, but um, that's neither here nor there. I'm not here to complain. I am critical of the things that I think Nintendo could improve on. But ultimately, I'm pretty pleased with Switch to the point it might be my favorite Nintendo platform, at least my favorite as an adult. Thank you guys for tuning in, and I'll catch you guys in the next video.